My name is Chuck Riley. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. And it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning to our second leadership lecture by Mr. William A. Grimm. Before joining the faculty of the Rollins College MBA program full-time as Professor of Practice in Entrepreneurship and Negotiation, Mr. Grimm practiced law as a securities lawyer for 35 years. While a partner in the law firm of Gray Robinson, Mr. Grimm's practice focused on technology companies and the unique problems they face. His engineering background assisted him in becoming general counsel to many high technology companies in the Central Florida area. He has handled numerous mergers and acquisitions as well as venture capital transactions for high technology and other companies and he is a well-known speaker in Central Florida at seminars on venture capital financing and initial public offerings. Mr. Grimm has been instrumental in assisting companies in going public and he has served on the boards of directors of several high technology companies. After serving as an officer in the United States Navy and prior to attending law school, Mr. Grimm was a vice president of corporate finance for an investment banking firm. Prior to that, he was the chief financial officer of a startup technology company. Mr. Grimm holds a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering from Penn State, an MBA from the University of Florida, and a law degree from the Stetson University College of Law. He's the author of many published articles and the book, What Entrepreneurs Need to Know, Avoiding Big Mistakes That Can Prevent Success. It was published in 2006 by Trafford Publishing. Mr. Grimm also served as chairman of the advisory board of the Rollins Center for Advanced Entrepreneurship for six years. We're very fortunate to have Mr. Grimm with us this morning. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Chuck. You know, I, I was reflecting, Bob Rich and Chuck, we were talking about uh, our memories of being in your, in your chairs, so to speak. In 1961, which I know is a long time ago, I was sitting in an auditorium like this at Penn State, getting ready to graduate in mechanical engineering, and Joe Paterno was an assistant coach at that time. That tells you how old uh, uh, Joe Paterno was, and it's a tragedy what happened um, at Penn State and to Joe Paterno and about a greater tragedy to the victims. But what happened in large part to Joe Paterno was he thought that he received a report, passed it upstairs, which I undoubtedly was the policy, and proceeded to not do anything at the after that because I must, he probably assumed somebody else is going to do it. That decision probably took five seconds. Think about that. It ruined his career. It's unbelievable how quickly you can make a decision that's the wrong decision ethically. So we're going to talk about the ethics and how um, ethics get into your business. And, and a way to start this is not with this mind map. I want to show a video very quickly here. Okay, you baseball fans, stand by. He's going to face Derek Jeter. Derek, one for three tonight. Look at him. He gets plunked, and you could hear that up here. Now Madden is arguing with Lance Barksdale, the home plate umpire, and saying that the ball hit the bat. Oh, it hit the bat. Boy, I was going to say right before wow. that, either Derek Jeter is an excellent actor. Wow. Unless his arm is made of steel. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounded like a titanium golf club. <laughs> How many of you remember that? Happened two summers ago. What does that have to do with what we're going to talk about today? How many of you think that was cheating? By the way, he admitted that it didn't hit him two days later. So take out any uncertainty. Some people thought it might have hit him on the elbow. Didn't hit him. By the way, it didn't make a difference in the game. Uh, they lost. But he got, the, he got the first base. And technically, though, what happened, it was a bunt. It, in fact, was fair, and he didn't take the base. How many of you think it was just part of the game? So these are baseball players, part of the game. So I'm going to ask some, those that said it's part of the game. Let's talk about that for a minute. Let's hear, let's hear from the baseball players. Was it within the rules to fake being hit by a ball? 
Well, I'm not hearing any answer, I, 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 but it's not within the rules. Is there a rule against doing that? Well, not specifically. Um, was it sportsmanlike conduct? No. Is there a difference between sportsman, unsportsmanlike conduct and cheating? Well, let's think of Venn diagrams. Not all unsportsmanlike conduct is cheating, but all cheating is unsportsmanlike conduct. Why is it that a lot of people, and, I, and, and most baseball players say it's part of the game? Why? It's the nature of sports. It's the nature of professional sports, maybe, maybe all yeah. sports, although golf, sports golf is the only sport where you have to self-report, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you accidentally do something to your ball, you must report it. Nobody else is gonna, has that responsibility. Well, the arguments that were made here, by the way, there were numerous articles written about this immediately after the game. And one in the New York Times was quite interesting. It started out by saying, you know, is this what we want to show our little leaguers? Well, but then he went on and he started to conclude, you know, as long as it's not premeditated, it's okay. And he said, well, that happened in just a split second. So therefore, it was only premeditated for a split second. But it would not be okay if they put binoculars with somebody out in the scoreboard to watch the catcher signal. That's premeditated. So there, there are these differences about if you plan to cheat, it's not okay. If you cheat instantly, it's okay. You all see the differences of this? Um, so for those of you who played baseball for a moment, let's assume that you are now a coach for a little league team your son is playing, would you teach the Little League team, team, affirmatively teach, to do this? I'm looking around for, you know, the baseball players back here are looking down on the ground because they don't want to <laughs> make eye contact with me. Um, but would you teach Little Leaguers to cheat? Um, I think the answer is no. Um, let's move forward. Would you, would you teach a high, school, a high school baseball player to cheat? Like that. Anybody? Probably not. Let's move on to professional baseball. By the way, the opposing coach said the day after, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> and I think, sir, you said it's part of the game. It is. It's right? Because what happened, of course, the umpire was right behind him. And the first base umpire couldn't see it right. And they don't, don't have instant replays in baseball. When you say it's part of the game, we know it's not within the rules. We know it's not a particularly good example to set for children, which that writer, by the way, said. Why is it okay? It's okay because everyone does it. That's the reasoning. Everyone does it, therefore it's okay. Well, in your business, you're gonna run across this many, many times. Everyone does it, but you know it's not the right thing to do. When everyone does it, it is not okay. I hope you take that away from this uh, little talk today, if nothing else because it takes courage not to do something that everyone else is doing. I'm gonna talk about different things that easily happen. Um, I didn't realize my, uh, my pointer was on, sorry, distracting you. Um, I'm gonna talk about the kinds of things that you confront all the time in a business setting, and particularly in some instances, the engineering setting. So, so let me, um, let me uh, see if I can operate my mouse, and I think I can. I want to talk about what's the difference between a negligent act and an intentional act. Anybody? The, sir, we have one of, one of your <laughs> professors about to tell us. Uh, help me. So intentional means you tried to do something. Negligent means you sort of forgot or just didn't do something. Yeah, intentional requires uh, knowing Knowing that you're doing it, you meant, you meant to do it, 
Negligent means that you failed to use reasonable care. So in automobile accidents, it's almost always negligence. You failed to use reasonable care. You surely didn't intend to cause whatever happened. Um, what's the difference between a criminal wrong and a civil wrong? You ever heard those two, two differences? A criminal wrong requires intent. A civil wrong can be a breach of a statute that doesn't have any penalties to it, but it's a breach of a statute. Negligence is a civil wrong. You can't go to jail for negligence. You can go to jail when you commit an intentional act that is a crime. All crimes, by definition, by the way, are unethical behavior. But does a person commit a crime if the person does not know the act committed is a crime? I heard yes. All, all people are presumed to know the law. By the way, our statutes in Florida take up volumes of about like so. And the criminal statutes are literally this uh, thick of a book of criminal statutes. You can't possibly know every act that's defined as a crime in those statutes, but you in fact are presumed to know. And you cannot claim, I did not know. Now, but if it requires intent, how in the world can we say, but you intended to commit a crime? No, nope, that's not the test. Did you intend to do the act, which happens to be a crime? The answer is yes. You didn't realize it was a crime, but you intended to commit the act. You are going to be guilty. Intent is largely the problem in unethical conduct. In fact, it's hard to say you negligently committed an unethical act. It's, it, you must intentionally commit an unethical act for it to be unethical to you. The test is always subjective, which means it's you personally. What did you intend to do? It's not what everybody else thinks you should have done. It's what you intended to do. So, uh, what is a breach of ethics? Well, clearly, if it's unlawful, we know, we know that one. That's easy. Is it a violation of a standard of conduct? Well, who sets the standards? Um, is it morally wrong? Does it violate an ethical code of the company? All large companies have ethical codes that go on for about 20 pages. Is the appearance of a breach of ethics as harmful as the breach of ethics itself? Will you know it when you see it? And will you know it when you see it? You know, uh, all lawyers learn this, I think, on their first day of class in law school. The U.S. Supreme Court defined pornography when Justice Black wrote the opinion, and the test was, believe it or not, I know it when I see it. That's what a Supreme Court justice says is a test. I mean, frankly, it's humorous in some respects because that's, that's ludicrous to be a test. And yet that is the test that continues to be used. And we look at it as a community. Does the community somehow believe that it's pornography, if you will? It, of course, pornography is generally accepted today, which it was not at that time. But will you know it when you see it? Often you won't especially if you're told to do something by your superior, and you say, you know, I don't know that that's quite right. But, I, but how should I know? My, my superior told me it must be right. That is a very difficult position to be in. What do you do? And we'll talk about that when we get to um, the very last topic is, can you be a whistleblower? Do you have the courage to whistleblow on somebody that you see doing something wrong, or more likely, your superior doing something wrong. That's almost always where it comes from. Um, so let's, let's go through a number of things that happen all the time in terms of, um, I don't know if any of you have had uh, expense accounts yet. It is incredibly easy to cheat. And I can assure you, if you ask anybody, they'll all say everybody does it. 
This is one of those traps. And many, many people do it. Now, if you go, what, by the way, when the CEO cheats on an expense account, believe it or not, you would say, how could it ever be discovered that the CEO cheated on an expense account? I can assure you, it's like a viral. <laughs> it's like a viral video. It will travel around. Think of what happened to the uh, president CEO of HP. He was making $20 million a year. He cheated on his expense account by covering $20,000 of expenses for, uh, I'll, I'll say, a girlfriend. Um, you know, and he was fired by the board of directors and the board of directors then took horrible heat because the market value of the company went down by $1 billion over that. It's recovered. But it was incredibly bad judgment. He knew what he was doing. They could not possibly tolerate this. Not possibly. Because it would spread instantly. And as soon as the CEO does it, everybody can do it. That's the message. You will be in those positions as supervisors someday. And everybody will watch your behavior. You cheat, I can assure you, you have given permission to everyone that reports to you to cheat. Well, what else? Let's, let's see if we can go to nepotism. Everybody knows what nepotism is? Hiring your, your, hiring your brother, <laughs> hiring your children, hiring your cousin. Now, in family-owned companies, that's, that's what you do. That's, that's what the company is there for. But when you have outside investors in a company and you are in a position to hire people and you hire a relative, what's the chance, let's use probability, what's the probability that person is the most qualified person for that position? Zero. <laughs> Zero. And it causes horrible morale problems for people when they see this happening. They know there's favoritism going on. It is unethical to do so. But once again, I want to make the exception in a family-owned company. That is the goal of the family-owned company, and it's okay. It's not unethical. It's absolutely ethical because that is the goal. And it's known by all, all people associated with the company that it's a family-owned company. Um, harassment. Well, we all, know, we all know about this. Penn State really, of course it was harassment. It was way beyond harassment. But... Harassment occurs all the time, and it, all, it takes very subtle forms. It's very hard to, to prevent, but the person who can prevent harassment is you. Not someone else, you. If you observe it, report it. Of course, don't do it. But it's easy for me to say that, by the way, because I, once again, it's, it's, you're in the trap of everybody does it and especially in engineering. <laughs> uh, and it's only because of historically, we didn't have many women in engineering. Now we do, which is great. But unfortunately, it goes on in any kind of group where men greatly outnumber the women. Harassment exists. It should. It is unethical. It must be reported. So you can even have an atmosphere of tolerance. That's the same thing. Of course, there are always lawsuits about this, and um, you cannot believe what people have to testify to when their depositions are taken as to what they did, didn't do, didn't report, etc. It's always a horror story when that happens. Well, let's go on to uh, another one. How about lying to suppliers and stockholders? Is it okay to lie in negotiations? Here, here's an example. You're in charge of purchasing, uh, let's say, a Tupperware for a moment. And you're going to buy 1,000 PCs. Let's, say, let's, let's make them Lenovo or Dell notebooks. And the salesperson for Lenovo comes in, makes a proposal. Here's the price. And you say, I have a quote from Dell that's 20% under that. Will you match this price? You do not have that quote. That is a lie. Don't do it. It happens every day in purchasing. 
where people lie about what others have proposed or quoted to them. And they have no obligation, by the way, to show you those quotes. So you can't prevent the other person from doing it, but you sure as hell can prevent yourself from doing it. But here's the temptation. It does actually improve your leverage in negotiation if you lie. That's the temptation. I try to tell my students in negotiation, say this, I'm confident I can get a quote from Dell that's 20% less than yours. Will you give me that price? Think about that. That's hardly the same. There's a, there's a, a logical disconnect from that as opposed to I have a quote. But you haven't lied. And you have to put the fear in the other side that, well, it might be true. Purchasing and negotiation, negotiation of all types, is fraught with lying because people believe everybody does it. It's the everybody does it test again. Don't do it. It's tempting. Try to remember that 20 years from now, by the way, which will be hard because you will find out. You will have been the victim of lying in negotiation. But don't do it yourself. How about um, misleading financial statements? Uh, I, work, I work on this all the time, of course, with companies um, in Central Florida that are raising capital. And um, young companies are always tempted to puff financial statements in different ways. And the test is always this. It's almo almost humorous. I say, you know, that's not quite correct. Let's put it correctly. And, and the person will say to me, well, wait a second. They're not going to invest if we show that. Well, duh, you just met the test of you have to tell people something that's going to affect their decision to invest in your company. And that is the test right there. As soon as you conclude they won't invest if I tell them this and yet it's the truth, you have to tell them. It is really, really hard for people raising capital, often for the first time, to tell all the facts because there are bound to be some negative things if they tell all the facts. But you have to have the courage to do it. And of course, what you'd like to say, yes, this is negative, but this is what we're doing to correct it. That's pretty good. It's better to say, that's not true. <laughs> it, is, it's, it is in fact true, but I'm going to tell you it's not true. That's not good. Well, how about, um, here are the ways, the way to do it. So often, companies that haven't had an audit will show on their um, balance sheet the fair market value of some assets or they'll capitalize product development, often in software, which you can't do, certainly in a startup company. Because what you do is you shift from expense, it, do, it doesn't show up as a loss to your company if you capitalize the development costs for software. And many of you are in that, are getting ready to be in that business. It's really tempting to do so because you don't want to show the large losses. But anybody in my shoes who knows accounting can look at that and say, uh, you, you have no clue what you're doing. By doing that, hopefully it wasn't intentional because it's wrong. Um, failing to accrue all liabilities. There are, there are so many things in young companies where they've committed themselves to something, uh, don't want to do it anymore, but they're obligated to do it under contract, but they don't show the potential liability that's sitting there either on their balance sheet as an actual liability or in some footnote that says, this is happening, we may be liable for this. It's a, I seldom ever see those things. And so when I put companies through the questions and ask them, is it, almost always I find there's some things, oh, I accrued my compensation, but I didn't put it on the balance sheet, but I expect to get it sometime in the future. No, oh, it's $60,000. Well, it has to be on the balance sheet. And that is a common problem right there. Not complying with generally accepted accounting practices, we call GAP. Boy, is that easy to do. QuickBooks, by the way, does not necessarily comply with generally accepted accounting practices. And most companies start out with QuickBooks. Um, but these are the kinds of things that are a violation of general accepted accounting principles. Oh, this is one you all would be used, uh, getting into, overstating what percent is complete on a project. You're going to be involved in projects. 
your supervisor comes to you and say, please put in the memorandum that we're 30% complete as far as your work is concerned and your work is, say, a large part of the contract, but you know, in fact, at best, you're 10% complete. First of all, why is the supervisor doing that? There's an accounting reason. It's very likely that there's a revenue goal that that supervisor has for this quarter and a profit goal. And by having 30% complete instead of 10% complete, the supervisor will meet or exceed that goal. But at 10%, there's going to be a loss. And there's going to be reduced revenue than you thought what you would have. You are being asked to make an accounting decision without knowing that it's going to mislead investors or others. How, will you have the courage to say, that's not going in my memorandum? <laughs> we'll get the whistleblower. That's borderline whistleblower, right? Because you haven't told anybody yet, but you've refused to do something that you don't think is right, which I hope you have the courage to do. Um, there's another one that we often run into. When you have a, a, a large a product that's quite expensive, say several hundred thousand dollars, and you're approaching the end of the quarter, the product's not quite complete, hasn't, hasn't yet passed all the tests that it ought to pass, and you're ordered to ship it. Why? Why are you ordered to ship it? I can assure you why. They want to take in the revenue in that quarter. And if they don't, the profit that will be generated by that's not going to be in that quarter. It'll, it'll be moved into the next quarter. Once again, you'll be asked to do that without being given a reason. A reason. Now, as far as you're concerned, you shouldn't ship it for, because customers should deserve better. But there's a reason why you're being asked to do that usually in the background. Once again, don't do it. Now, there are legitimate reasons to expedite production at the end of a quarter and ship it. But that's okay as long as, in fact, it's shippable. Yeah, people m manage earnings that way. They either delay for the next quarter or they accelerate and all of a sudden you see it plant working at 24 hours a day for the last five days of a quarter. And that's the reason they're doing it, really, when, it, when they would ordinarily not be working 24 hours a day. They're trying to move some future revenue back into this quarter. That is legitimate, what I just told you, though. But it's not legitimate to do that. So let me... Um, how many of you have ever actually seen a business plan? One, two. Well, you're all in the business. If you work for an entrepreneurial company, you will definitely see business plans. And by the way, you can have an entrepreneurial company that's 100, 200 employees. It's a, ma it's a mindset, not, not a size. Um, business plans are common. Business plans are almost always written by people who have never written a business plan before. <laughs> and that result is there are often statements in there that are not true. And, and why is a business plan written? Almost always to raise money. It is seldom the business plan is written to operate the business with. In fact, I can honestly say I've only seen one in my entire career where somebody wrote a business plan and actually worked from that business plan for the next year. It was a very successful company, by the way. They put it away once they've raised the money. End of story. Next round, we'll do another business plan. And Smart investors will say, let me look at that previous business plan to see what you said you were going to do. And it's always a shock. You didn't actually do what you said you were going to do. Now, can you lie by making statements of future achievements? Think about that. Can you lie that you're going to achieve revenues this in the next year of $3 million in your startup? Is, is that a lie? It's impossible to be a lie, by the way, because you don't know. It's something, a prediction of future events, except if you know with certainty you can't possibly do that because of limitations on some things, then that would be a lie. You know with certainty you can't get there. All business plans are written with the future in mind. Investors try, do rely on business plans, but only to statements of fact as to what it is today, how many shares you have outstanding, what the background of your people is, uh, those kinds of statements of fact. 
uh, knowledgeable investors seldom rely on what is in the plan in terms of predicted revenue. They will rely on what you say your strategy is. It is so easy to lie in business plans. It's incredible. And you will, you will be participating in business plans often. Not that you will necessarily write them, but you will be participating in business plans. And here are the things that often happen. People will almost always say they have an educational background that they don't. Not good. Or they puff up what their experience is. You know, I, I worked as a supervisor for Dynatronics for 10 years, when in fact they weren't even close. They were a project manager with three people. No, not good. Uh, inaccurate, previous, I can't even see it, jobs. It's, it's amazing how people will invent previous jobs on a resume in this kind of context. Um, involvement of advisors who haven't agreed to be advisors or directors. I've found my name in business plans from time to time that I'm on the board of directors and I, I'm not on the board of directors. They never asked me to be on the board of directors. They're thinking about asking me, but they haven't told me that and, and, and yet I show up. Uh, I had one just yesterday, as a matter of fact. They, we were told, here's a list of our directors. It was, it was, it was fantastic. The background, then they gave us the actual documents by uh, email last night. Now, they have, they're not on the board of directors. <laughs> they're thinking about joining the board of directors. That's a lie. I laugh about this because it happens so often, but these are the kinds of lies that you're going to be tempted to make. And another one is, is always this claims of agreements with customers when no agreements exist. I, I had that happen just a couple of days ago. We were talking to a young company that was, had raised a lot of money and they claimed that they had agreements with something like 20 major events, concerts and so forth, that had contracted with them to put up a really good web page, et cetera, et cetera. So I started, well, what's the revenue? Oh, well, we haven't gotten to that yet. Well, okay, are they gonna prepay? Well, we haven't gotten to that yet. Well, where's the agreement? Well, it's verbal. Well, is it an agreement? No, it's not quite an agreement. In other words, by asking the questions I discover, they don't have agreements. They're out trying to impress these 20 events by making up web pages for them, thinking that once they have that web page up, the, the customer will, bu will buy it or pay them for it. But they made the representations to me and other potential investors They had agreements with these people. Those who were sitting with me, I can assure you, are not going to invest. No matter what, that, that company absolutely lied to us. Well, let me, um, in effect, uh, this is what happened here. But these are some things that they have, you have to disclose in a company, you must disclose if an officer director was in a bankruptcy. Whether that person personally was bankrupt or was an officer or director of a company that went bankrupt. People don't want to admit that. They have to. In fact, most companies, certainly that I'm gonna advise, won't have a director or an officer who's been in bankruptcy because you must admit it. And it's usually not good. There are sometimes it's okay because frankly, investors sometime appreciate failure as long as it was an honest failure. Previous lawsuits involving fraud. Um, you always have to disclose that kind of lawsuit. You don't have to disclose a lawsuit where you're sued because you breached a contract. That's not fraud. Fraud means intentional wrong. Um, Previous regulatory sanctions. Often the Federal Trade Commission will come down hard on a young company and say, you, you had an ad here that you can't back up with the facts. And they're enjoined from having that ad and they have to run their ads through the FTC for three years. And they don't disclose that to investors. I was invited down to a company in Miami that made dog collars that had a sonic system to them that would repel fleas. <laughs> okay, and I, I remember I kept saying to myself, I don't think so. But, but anyway, they produced a study for me, um, and they were selling these, by the way, a zillion of them. And, and they produced a study done by somebody in Alabama that demonstrated, and they had fleas in one a cage and, uh, you know, different fleas. And they turned on this collar, and sure enough, fleas go, Phew. Well, they were falsified studies. We fi actually filed in registration state with the SEC, um, and then we discovered that study was false. We, con oh, well, we should have done this. We contacted the person that did the study. No, 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 that, that, that's not what caused those fleas to go like that. Anyway, they were put out of business. 
Federal Trade Commission came in, after put them put them out of business because of advertisements, it doesn't work. Think about it. Well, why in the world would s uh, you know sound waves um, cause the fleas to, to to jump? Anyway, um, so well, let's go to the next one. Improper tax avoidance. Oh boy, here's a sensitive subject. How many of you have bought something on the internet where sales tax was not charged? Everybody in this room. I'll bet. How many of you voluntarily paid the use tax that you should have paid in lieu of the sales tax? I didn't. <laughs> I, none of you did. Guess who the wrongdoer in that is? It's not the company that didn't charge sales tax. Yet you hear that all the time. Amazon didn't charge your sales tax. They're violating, violating the law in the state of Florida. No, wrong. You're violating the law. If the, if the merchant doesn't charge sales tax, you're obligated to pay the flip of that use tax. Nobody does. So that's the, that's the big loss of revenue that goes on for states. And they're going to stop this. And one way they're going to stop it is, I think... In less than five years, you're going to have a form you have to fill out every year with your income tax to the state of Florida that says, I purchased the following things on the internet and I failed to pay the use tax. Here's my check for the use tax. It is coming. But you're the ones, including me, that violate the law when sales tax is not paid. Ah. Um, Independent contractors versus employees, a very common problem with young companies, small companies. Let's not, let's not have to withhold taxes. Let's not have to pay Social Security. Let's not have to put them on our health plan. Let's, not do let's hire them as independent contractors. And they're responsible, therefore, for all of that stuff themselves. Have any of you ever heard about independent contractors versus employees? You will hear about it. In fact, I would guess half of you in this room at one point in time will be an independent contractor. Well, companies have a problem. If a company hires a person as an independent contractor, yet supervises that person as if that person is an employee, the company is breaking the tax law and must withhold taxes, must pay the company's share of Social Security, um, Medicare, et cetera, et cetera, must. And when they don't, they're subject to humongous penalties. And when companies go to raise capital, small companies, and have done that, they have to cure it because there's a horrible liability sitting there that they are not acknowledging because they treated people as independent contractors who are, in fact, employees. And by the way, there are 14 items to test to see whether a person is an employee or an independent contractor, and you have to pass all of them. But the most uh, prevalent one is, do I control what that person does on a day-to-day -day basis? The answer is, if I do, the person's an employee. Um, oh, company pays personal expenses without reporting that as income. In smaller companies, that's also prevalent. If you're a founder of a company, you will be tempted to uh, lease a condo and charge it to the company, yet you never take a single customer there. Under the tax laws, you should be taxed on the amount of rent the company pays for that condo. Let me go to the next one. Undisclosed conflicts of interest. Uh, this is not as prevalent, but um, you'll find it as you get more senior in a company that there can be conflicts of interest that, uh, that are not disclosed. All large companies have a disclosure policy for conflicts of interest. Are we doing business with a relative of yours? Um, do you have a side job that actually competes with the company? Well, you're going to get fired if that's the case, that's for sure. Um, but conflicts of interest are often a problem. Paying commissions to a company owned by an officer, um, insurance companies, that's almost <laughs> that's a, that's a company. You know, you're a co-founder of a company, so you purchase the casualty insurance for your company from your brother-in-law. And if you have investors, that's not a good thing to do. You, the likelihood of paying the correct premium in that scenario is not good. The likelihood is you will overpay that premium, often big time. Well, the next one's easy, isn't it? Paying and taking bribes. I had um, 
I had five people from Siemens in my class yesterday, um, my ethics class, and um, the one of the officers there was the compliance officer, and she spoke as to this horrible scandal that hit Siemens about two years ago, where they were paying bribes all over the world to get these major power company um, contracts. And uh, once again, the, the answer was, oh, everybody does it. Not only that, but in some countries, you have to do it. Well, they, they found out the hard way. Uh, no, you're not going to do that, Siemens. Even though you're a German con con company, you're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. You're therefore subject to the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and you cannot pay bribes to government officials anywhere in the world to get business. They were fined more than $2.5 billion by the SEC in the United States. Most of the board members were retired by mandate. The president of the company, the CEO, was fired. The president and CEO probably had no knowledge of this. Nevertheless, that's what has to happen when you have a major scandal like that. But bribes are come in subtle ways. You take a supplier or a supplier takes you to dinner. Well, you know, in Lockheed Martin as an example, you can't do that. You, you can't go to dinner unless you pay. That makes sense. But um, in, other in other companies, other situations, suppliers will take you out to dinner big time and uh, spend a lot of money. And you can be sure they're not doing it because they're friends. They have, they're doing it to influence you for some decision you're getting ready to make. So what if a supplier pays for you and your spouse to attend a half-day meeting in Bermuda and pays for you to stay for 10 days? Well, that's crystal clear, isn't it? It is crystal clear. Not only is it crystal clear it's a bribe, but you should be charged taxable income for what they're carrying there so that you could be in horrible difficulties with the IRS over that, as well as it's a bribe. But where do you draw the line between dinner and a Bermuda trip? It's not easy. Best thing to do is don't even have dinner. <laughs> it's the bad, it's, but it's very tempting to, to not do that. Well, how about misleading advertising? I mentioned the one about um, the dog collar, making claims not supported by the evidence. Uh, there was an interesting um, development uh, not too long ago, maybe, maybe just a year ago. One of the drug companies um, had advertised one of these prescription drugs, you know, that's taken over the advertising, where you can't buy it directly, but they're influencing you to, to tell the doctor to buy that prescription drug. Well, they, f they made some misrepresentations in that. And so a spokesperson came on, and they had to pay a lot of money to, to do this, said we made, the, F the Federal, Tr Federal Trade Commission has advised us that we made misleading statements. The following statements we made were false. This is what we should have said. Wow. That was, that, frankly, that was stunning when you see that. But Federal Trade Commission, who monitors advertising, uh, did do it. Um, the Federal Trade Commission does have policies on advertising, even for small companies, and, and certainly on the internet, how to advertise on the internet. So I always go to this, with how do vitamin companies get away with their claims? I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not for vitamin companies. Uh, note what they always say. They have that little disclaimer at the bottom of the bottle, always says this has not been reviewed by the uh, what, FDA. Uh, of course it hasn't been. But what it says always is, this supports your immune system. You ever, you ever hear that? Think about it. When you hear that next time on television, listen for that word. That's all they can say. It supports our, the, your immune system. Guess what? Any vitamin supports your immune system. They do not do clinical studies to find out whether they could make claims for fear. It's almost a certainty that they can't meet the claims. And yet it's a, I don't know, 20 to 50 billion dollar a year industry. It, it annoys me every time I see those damn commercials. But um, I have one more, if I can get up there. Can you be a whistleblower? Boy, does it take courage to be a whistleblower. Now, most, many big companies have a, a safety channel that you can go to anonymously to blow the whistle. Unfortunately, I have to tell my ethics class, whistleblowers get fired. Even though there's law, there are procedures that say you shouldn't get fired, 
Many, many companies will find another reason to fire you. And that is why it takes courage. And the woman that report with blew the whistle initially on Enron was head of international accounting. She knew that there was a problem here. She went to the SEC. She got fired. She said later, I knew I was making a career termination decision, which she did, and she got fired. By the way, she's on the speaking circuit for $50,000 per speech today. She's doing really well, but there were a couple years that were really difficult for her. So, can you be a whistleblower? I'd like to leave that with you because I can't tell you how much courage it takes to do that. Because you're like, you, when you say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, but I don't want to lose my job. Wow. What a, what a tough decision. Well, I, I enjoyed this, um, to talk to you. You know, in uh, 1961, I was coming out with an engineering degree. I had no clue I'd ever be a lawyer. I can assure you I had no clue I'd ever be a professor. So for one, one or two minutes, I'm going to, Bob Rich asked me to sort of wind through that. I joined the Navy uh, right after uh, undergraduate school, became an officer, a supply officer on a destroyer. And to get there, you have to go through like a mini MBA in the Navy, six month intense program on inventory management, food management, payroll management, all those things, ship store management, barber shop management, all those kinds of things that go on in a ship. And, I, uh, and so I graduate from that. Three days later, I report to a ship. Three days after that, I am one of four department heads on a destroyer of 18 officers and 300 men reporting to the captain, as an ensign, by the way. And that's sort of a wake-up call when you're in the military. But it did do this to me. It really turned me on to business. Here I was an engineer, no clue about business. I loved it. And uh, I said to myself, I'm going to get an MBA when I get out of the Navy. And sure enough, that's what I did. And fortunately, the GI Bill was still in place. And it paid my whole way, University of Florida, to get my MBA. I still had no idea what lawyers did, by the way. <laughs> I couldn't imagine that was a productive career. Okay? I thought it had to be engineer and maybe with some business. Um, but um, I joined two engineers from a company that I joined after my MBA from a company in Castleberry called Dynatronics. It's not there anymore, but it was a big company with 400 employees, part of General Dynamics. And I joined two engineers who were on a task force with me to try to commercialize data communications equipment derived from tele, uh, telemetry equipment used for the Apollo space shot. The space program was the birthplace of data communications and all the coding, error coding, and so forth. And so we came up with a, a giant plan to commercialize all this technology. We were turned on. But two engineers took a little piece of that business plan, went to San Antonio, and over a weekend raised $2 million from some oil men who invest in wildcatting. They never saw a business plan. <laughs> and I became their chief financial officer. We raised some more money, took it public. And um, the company was, it was, an, it was an interesting experience. I won't go into all the details, but... Three years later, I joined one of the investment banking firms that had taken us public to take other companies public. Two years into that, I was living on an airplane with a wife and two children. I barely saw them. I said, I've got to do something. And the only people that know what they're doing in this business are the lawyers. <laughs> so I once again used the GI Bill. I went to law school for three years. Uh, it was the easiest time in my life, by the way. You don't think so right now because you're, you're still in, the, in your education phase, but it was really interesting and easy. And when I got out, I started a law practice here in Orlando on corporate and securities matters for technology companies. And I quickly had a, a lot of technology companies, and I've taken I, every technology company that's gone public in Central Florida, I've taken it public. That's not a lot, by the way. It's probably five or six, but um, <laughs> well, that's all, that's all that could go public. Although the one that, that I had been involved with for many, many years was SawTech, and I know SawTech has some, a professor, at least on the staff, who was involved with SawTech. Um, it started out as a military supplier of surface acoustic wave filters for communication system, which just by accident are the best kinds of filters to use in cell phones. Every cell phone, I'm looking for mine, has six of those filters in them. 
Sawtech went from being a $10 million a year company in 1989 to sell out in 2002 for $1.6 billion. It's located over in Apopka. It's called Triquent because that's who acquired it. They have the uh, design facility there. All manufacturing is down in Costa Rica. It's a huge place down in Costa Rica. How do, do you ever know there's a company in town headquartered here that sold for $1.6 billion. No, you know, you never hear about it. But that's what everybody should strive for, I hope. Uh, we made 200 plus millionaires, by the way, of the employees. Yeah. What is your advice for an engineer who wants to be an entrepreneur and wants to move their career on, who has an idea, a concept? Because a lot of our students, when they go through senior design, do. Yeah, I know, it's especially in the computer science school. Um, my advice usually is at worst work for at least a year. Don't, don't, don't quit your day job. Um, while, you're, while you're developing what you want to develop, uh, get a lot of advice from people who have done it because there's so many pitfalls um, to taking an idea, to a company, to raising capital, to a success. And very few make it through that process. Um, but I urge every, everybody Get a job, if it's with a small company, that's fine. If it's with a big company, that's fine too. You're gonna learn a lot in the first one, two or three years of your career, and then you will be in a much better position to start or become part of a founding team of a company. And it takes at least a year of planning to do that. At least a year. Okay, one question behind you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah, how do how do nonprofits appeal to venture capital firms to invest in them? They don't. <laughs> no, venture capital firms don't invest in nonprofits. But nonprofits raise more money every year than all companies put together in the United States. That's their business to raise money. Um, they talk to the same people individual wise that invest in young companies, by the way. Those are their donors. Um, but what's happening in the nonprofit area is they're learning how to behave like for-profit organizations. And there are a lot of programs to help them do that because they have to use the money they receive more efficiently. Um, but once again, I joke with this. We have a whole nonprofit program at Rollins for the uh, CEOs of nonprofits. They do. They raise more capital than all of my clients put together every single year. It's amazing how, they, how they're able to do that. But no. Investors that are looking for a profit do not invest in nonprofits. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's thank Mr. Grant. Thank you.